welcome to episode 288 of Cinematary. I'm your host, Zach Dennis, and I'm here with Nathan Smith, Michael O'Malley, and Dylan Moore. And in today's episode, we'll be talking about movies that we saw this week in part one. And in part two, we will be continuing our intro to Avant Garde series with a selection of surreal silence. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and jump into movies that we saw this week. Nathan, I'm going to kick it off with you. You saw a new release. Yeah, I, for some reason, um, the f- like the first movie that I've actually seen in like wide release in theaters, not a press screen or anything this year was for some fucking reason, Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> um, get, get a press pass for that or press credentials. Though. No, I okay. just wanted to there like drink an icy and like <laughs> see something stupid. And, um, I, you know, like halfway enjoyed detective Pikachu. Uh, from last year I don't don't have any relationship at all to the Pokemon franchise unlike our good friend Andrew Swafford who had a lot of thoughts about that movie uh, on cinematary.com when it came out Um, and so I was hoping for maybe something like that that's a little weirder a little more in its own distinct universe but Sonic the Hedgehog was unfortunately like not that at all and it's actually pretty dry pretty boring and pretty grounded in like a very flat version of our own reality um sonic i always felt like sonic in the games was like kind of a teen you know like he seems like he has a sort of like (laughs) middle finger fuck you edgy attitude like kind of a you know like a bart simpson almost and in yeah, this yeah. movie, he's like a child, and there's also literally bit like baby Sonic, like you know, baby Yoda <laughs> vibes uh, in the beginning of the movie. <laughs> and the movie starts in like the extended Sonic universe off of Earth, but then Sonic comes to Earth. <laughs> And he becomes best friends with a small town cop played by James Marsden. He's pursued by Dr. Robotnik, a.k.a. Eggman, who's played by Jim Carrey as a sort of deep state government contractor um, who hints at having done regime change in uh, Latin America (laughs) and the Middle East. Um, There's a lot of weird product placement in this movie, a lot of Olive Garden product placement, strangely product placement for the real estate listing site Zillow, which I don't know why that's like in what is very straightforwardly a kid's movie. Um, And also there's like a weird joke where Sonic is getting bombed by drones and he's like fighting the drones and he says, wow, like Amazon really dodged a bullet. You know, they were going to deliver packages with these. And um, so I don't know. It's just like I I feel like there have been a lot of movies, particularly Marvel movies and like even the Fast and Furious where there's all these kind of gags about like drone warfare and American imperialist regime change and like the deep state and stuff but I feel like this is the first maybe maybe I'm missing you know some examples I'm sure there's other examples but this is maybe like the first kids movie that I feel like I've seen joke about that um And honestly, strangely, I mean this both jokingly, but also a little bit sincerely, the movie that it reminded me the most of was uh, Richard Jewell from last year by good old Clint Eastwood. Um, Because like the good hearted rent a cop Richard Jewell um, Sonic is a is an outsider a social pariah who worships cops and just wants to be a hero and he tries to do right and he's just persecuted by the big government you know uh, and it has the same like valorization of small town police versus demonization of the federal government uh, that is in Richard Jewell and is kind of endemic to like Clint Eastwood's worldview. I don't know. It's like a weirdly uh, Wait. conservative. So he's not movie. saving animals? <laughs> he's not saving animals in the movie? Um, not really. He's like trust trying to get home 
and Robotnik just like bombs him and tries to blow him up. And then there's like this whole subplot where he finds out about the concept of a bucket list. And he's like, oh, I only have a little bit of time left on Earth before I go back to my planet. I want to do a bucket list. And he tries to do all these things. And there are these sequences that sort of blatantly rip off the Quicksilver scenes from the recent X-Men movies where Sonic slows down time so he can like cross things off of his bucket list really fast. Um, and they're like scored to these awful like car commercial butt rock songs and uh, and then the last thing on his bucket list is like make a real friend and James Marsden sees that and is like oh I gotta be his friend and it's just like why the fuck is this child's this like outer space animal child's best friend an adult human cop like he already has a best friend Tails yeah there's like no really uh, there's none of the Sonic supporting cast really like I'm sure they're trying to open it up and save that for the sequel but it was kind of disappointing you know a sort of missed opportunity I feel like I would have rather seen a like team up movie than just like Sonic solo adventure I think I don't know it's just like every one of these like every blockbuster it just sort of feels like a stepping stone and I felt like very tired after watching it uh, which sort of par for the course it's nice to see Jim Carrey like doing antics in a big movie um again i don't know the last time i like saw him in a movie kind of like this tier but he seemed to be having fun i wish i could have been having as much as fun as he was having <laughs> there's actually some cool like weird like 60s psychedelic rock musical sequences with just like dr robotnik having a good time on screen and that's kind of fun but everything else is forgettable Hmm. So, <laughs> um, well, Sonic the Hedgehog is uh, racing in the theaters now, so uh, you can yeah, gotta go fast. Yeah, you, go, you can go check it out there. Um, you had a a trio of films though that you wanted to quickly go through. Uh, next up, yeah, I've been recently doing a kind of uh, rep series on my couch, going through some movies by the American independent filmmaker Hal Hartley, um, who I've seen one feature by him before, The Unbelievable Truth, and I've seen, I saw one of his shorts in like a college class, I think. And he was somebody I was always kind of interested in um, because I feel like I, I like a lot of those like 90s kind of offbeat dry humor American indie movies um, and there was recently a series a program of Hal Hartley movies here in New York and um, I didn't get to go uh, to any of those so I was like you know I'll catch up at home so I watched recently Trust from 1990 Amateur from 1994 and Henry Fool from 1997 um, and I think what's really interesting about Hal Hartley is um, you know he's this New York indie filmmaker with a kind of very mannered dry style you know people maybe kind of lump him in with like Noah Baumbach or Wes Anderson or something like that but I think what's really interesting about his movies is that largely they are about like very straight up working class characters um, largely set in Long Island and Queens you know these movies about like high school dropouts who get pregnant and um, like <sighs> electronics repairmen who get fired from their jobs constantly and just like people who don't who are kind of struggling to get by um, but it's still in this like very sort of uh, sometimes the dialogue is like you know very affected kind of intellectual philosophical um, this is sort of like an interesting trio of movies because I feel like there are some of his like biggest movies from the 90s from kind of his the period when he was like most successful and recognized um, trust is like a very evo maybe my favorite of the bunch, but it's like a very evocative um, romance and it's like just strange, but I found it like very um, like, I don't know. It's not really necessarily a like conventional melodrama, but I found it like to be a sort of like very emotionally vivid, uh, passionate kind of like domestic uh 
drama um, between two people who were, the world doesn't want to be together. Um, Amateur has Isabelle uh, Huppert and um, is about an ex-nun who is like new to the world and she writes pornography and she meets Martin Donovan who can't remember who he is um, but it turns out he's actually like the most successful like one of the most successful pornographers uh, in the world but they're just sort of like the whole movie trying to stumble and figure out who he is and there's a strange woman who's somehow connected and a lot of kind of almost Thomas Pynchon-esque conspiracies going around uh, these just like little relationships and uh, kind of emotional intrigues. Um, And Henry Fool is like the most, the longest of these movies. It's 140 minutes and it's almost like this very expansive novel has a very um, I think all of his movies have a very like literary quality to them and he has a lot of short films which I feel like he's somebody who's almost like making short stories in every movie. It's like a little just on Ensemble of different characters whose lives are colliding. And Henry Fool is really crazy. Um, it's about this garbage man played by James Urbaniak who meets this kind of drifter bum type who is a novelist but he's never published and he like claims to have done all these things but it's sort of uncertain and James Urbaniak's sister is played by Parker Posey and she gets mixed up with this guy the drifter guy whose name is Henry Fool and everybody in the movies also has like very I don't know just like character names like just very distinctive names um but i don't know they're just like these like all of his movies are like little stories that become like much larger and more abstract and like um on along with the sort of like emphasis on like people who are just like ordinary working class people there's also i feel like a very like um salient kind of like very uh apt like leftist framework um there's a character in henry fool played by kevin corrigan who's this like greaser asshole who just like gets in fights all the time and is constantly trying to beat up james urbaniak but people are going around advertise like uh canvassing for this like Trumpian uh, for lack of a better word like reactionary populist candidate and he gets swept up in it and it's like he becomes this like suit wearing white supremacist um, who is like abusing his his stepchild and um, uh, his wife and is like just a this horrible person um, and this, this is like you know I don't know a long time before I feel like people are really talking about uh, like re- reactionary right wing um, populism in this kind of way, but here it is in like 1997 and Henry Fool. So I'm excited to go deeper, um, and I would really recommend um, people like check out Hal Hartley. They're all a lot of them are like you know he has a lot of short films, but even a lot of the features are like a lot of times 80, 90 minutes. Um, I don't know. They're just like very weird movies. Like I think a lot of people would call them quirky but i think that word does it a disservice because it's like <laughs> yeah. very serious and, right. and intense and emotionally real even if there's yeah. a kind of artifice to it and, and stylization yeah I, I agree with you about trust because I, I think i've only seen three of his movies and i was like trust simple man and unbelievable truth and it's like uh yeah, I see why someone would say that like quirky in a way to where it's like ironic quirky but like the movie keeps going and it's not just that. And then by the end of it, you're kind of surprised what he's able to get out of it. I mean, particularly agreeing with you about trust because, you know, uh, people like almost (laughs) very theatrical, but deadpan at the same time and almost just saying their emotions very superficially and what they're getting at. But, but yet it like causes a kind of conflict that's, not melodramatic in the way you think it is. Uh, and I'm, I'm amazed that I feel like it pulls it off, uh, particularly with the conceit at the center of it is trust. So, uh, uh he's a good director. Yeah, no, I, your point about like 
character saying their feelings is very true. Um, before we get off this topic, I would just want to share this like amazing line of dialogue from Trust that I think is like a perfect example of that, which was the review that I posted on Letterboxd, um, where Martin Donovan, after he takes a new job, is like watching TV and somebody tells him to turn it off. And he says, I had a bad day. I had to subvert my principles and kowtow to an idiot. Television makes these daily sacrifices possible. It deadens the inner core of my being. So it's this like just very straight up, you know, putting it so plainly and obviously. Um, but it's just like stating the truth, you know, like it's just these characters just say uh, kind of immediately what they feel and think um, in a very in a way that just is like really uh, sh- kind of shocking almost um, sometimes because you don't really know sometimes I feel like moment to moment what's going to happen in his movies, which is what interests me about them. So cool. Are they uh, are they like available streaming anywhere? Um, the dinosaur, the zombie that is Fandor, <laughs> right, uh, yeah. I think has some of them. A lot of the shorts are on YouTube and in Vimeo. I think um, his other movies there are like various home video releases. I think, but not a lot of streaming, unfortunately. I was surprised. Uh, I found both Trust and um, but but Simple Man. My library had both of those, so. Uh, Michael, I'm going to toss it over to you. Check your line. Okay, so uh, I watched last night Joe vs. the Volcano, um, which is a 1990, yeah, 1990 um, movie that's a kind of like a like an existential comedy movie uh, written and directed by John Patrick Shanley. And I saw that name come across the credits at the beginning of the movie, and I was like, that name sounds familiar. And so after the movie, I looked it up, and it is none other than the Pulitzer Prize-winning uh, playwright who wrote Doubt. Uh-huh. Which is probably, yeah. like, if you've seen this movie and you've seen either the movie version or the play of Doubt, like, that is probably the most remarkably great thing about this movie is that the same man who wrote Doubt wrote Joe versus the Volcano. Because what happens in Joe versus the Volcano is that Um, Tom Hanks, who at the beginning of this movie sports this like awesomely terrible haircut, um, like, uh, it's like a Jerry, like mid nineties, Jerry Seinfeld haircut that hadn't been washed in a while. Um, and he's working at this, uh, (laughs) he's working as a, uh, like a, like, I guess like a records librarian at this like Brazil, like, like Terry Gilliam Brazil type company that's like just this uh you know really fantastically absurdly awful factory that he just like it's just like a field of mud outside and everyone just kind of shuffles in like zombies and he goes and sits down at his desk in which there's like a flickering like awful fluorescent light above it and he's not feeling good and he's not felt good for like a decade or something like that and so he goes to the doctor and the doctor tells him that he has a terminal disease called a brain cloud and he only has six months to live uh, and so he goes and like quits his job um, and then goes home and kind of like is going to like putter away his six months. And then this dude shows up who's like this rich, like Willy Wonka type character who tells him that he owns like a company that creates superconductors, I think. Um, and the company's in a bind because it needs this mineral, this rare mineral to create superconductors. However, the mineral can only be found on this one island on which there's a like a population of people um, who won't sell him the mineral unless they give unless he gives them something like material in exchange that they need. And what they need is uh, so there's a giant volcano on this island, and um, apparently once every 100 years this volcano erupts uh, or would erupt and destroy the island unless uh, a, a person voluntarily throws themselves into the abyss of the volcano's uh, crater. And uh, so the guy, the, the superconductor Willy Wonka guy, comes to Tom Hanks, having heard that somehow that Tom Hanks is terminally ill and only has a few months to live, and says, hey, Tom Hanks, uh, his name is Joe, actually, but um, <laughs> he says, hey, Joe, uh, would you like to live fabulously for the next couple of months and then throw yourself at the volcano before you die? Um, and Joe says yes. 
Um, and so he goes on this adventure that culminates in him supposedly having to throw himself into a volcano. Along the way, he meets Meg Ryan. And I believe this is the first movie in which Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks were paired up. Um, but he meets Meg Ryan, who actually plays three different roles. Uh, she plays a pair of sisters, uh, half-sisters, actually. And then she plays... Um, she actually plays one of the his co-workers at the very beginning of the movie as well. Um, and uh, Meg Ryan is phenomenal in this movie. She... Every time you see her, she's doing, like, a new accent. And so, like, you meet her as, like, this, like, valley girl. Like, tr- like it's the, the Willy Wonka guy's daughter who lives in Los Angeles. And she's an artist and a poet who's, like, living off her, her dad, basically, because her poetry and art don't sell. And she's got this, like, valley girl accent that's, like, ridiculously over the top. And then, like, in New York, uh, uh, where he works, um, the version of Meg Ryan that's there has this, like, ridiculous, like outsized like New York accent um and uh I mean there's just like the movie is full of delightful touches like that and um Tom Hanks eventually gets a haircut because he meets up with uh what's his name is it Ossie Smith or sorry Ossie Davis yeah whom uh I've only seen in Spike Lee movies but he's done other movies as well um who is his like cab driver not cab driver limo driver and he and this limo driver go on this like shopping spree because Tom Hanks now is fabulously rich because he's going to throw himself into the volcano. Um, and there's just this montage with like Ossie Davis, who's in like seven minutes of this movie, just like being this delightful, like almost like queer eye type, like life coach, um, like coaching Tom Hanks on how to be a better him. Um, and then the movie turns into this weird, like swashbuckling, like it, ad- like adventure on the sea because he has to sail to the Island and, I'm, I'm describing this movie poorly because there's just so much in this movie and it's just so offbeat all the time. Um, and so, I, I mean, I don't know what I was expecting when I watched, when I queued up Joe versus the volcano, but this was significantly stranger and funnier and more delightful than, um, I had expected. And like, by the end, it's like surprisingly like thoughtful as well. Like it's a movie with like, uh, existential themes on its mind. Like, what does it mean actually to live as a person knowing that one day you'll die. Um, what does it mean to truly have connection with somebody? And it, it does it in this way that's not like really like, it never really breaks the weird like uh, fantasy meets like Brazil satire thing. Like it never really breaks that mode, but it also kind of becomes very sweet as well. Um, and I was just completely taken by it. I know that Several of you here have, like, a background with this movie that I think you wanted to share. Um, And so maybe I should turn it over to you as well. (laughs) Uh, Dylan, do you want to share this, or should I? Uh, uh, Sure. No, that's okay. I'll I'll share the story the best I remember it at this point. Uh, So, uh, Michael, you bring up an interesting point about the philosophical, like, underpinnings uh, about this movie. We have... um, So, a lot of us... Uh, we all went to like uh, UT Knoxville, and we uh, ran a cinema club. The origin, and we story. had uh, one member. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and we had um, one member, uh, a guy who kept coming back. I, I believe he was actually like a lecturer and at um, never attended any of his classes. So he was a grown confirm, man, but, white hair. Um, yeah, yeah, he was. He was. He's older. He's probably at least in his fifties. Um, but he kept coming pretty frequently. I, you know, some days if the movie didn't sit with him, you know, he wouldn't show up. But he he came quite frequently. And um, you know, uh, we had this thing called members' choice, where one of the audience and, and uh, members get to you know pick a movie that they want to show and talk about. Um, and one that he brought up for for at least a year, as best of my knowledge, was Joe versus the volcano. Now. I think when we looked into it, we couldn't figure out why there was like, no, like, I, I don't know, like, <laughs> like, well, to your point of all the other things, you're like jam packed and kind of goofy that are just like, I'm not really sure why Terry, this person who kept, you know, coming up was like, he seemed relatively serious and minded and liked to bring up philosophical points in movies a lot. Um, but so he finally decided to show it and it like, all started to kind of like coalesce together, like his deep admiration and can constantly bringing up Kierkegaard <laughs> and like leaps of faith and anxiety and, you know, trying to live a, a good life 
under the notion of mortality. And it it's it was still such a bizarre thing that like I I can't quite believe it happened to be honest. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm I'm Team Terry though yeah. because I think that this movie is like it, it, it's like. It's not like maybe the best movie sure. of all time, yeah, yeah. but like it is a, like a very good movie. Like in a way that I wasn't, I was expecting some kind of goofy mm-hmm. and like cheesy and like uh, Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan, you know, whatever. Sure. Oh yeah. But I think that like this movie has qualities that I've not seen in other movie. Like Meg Ryan's performances are like front and center to me. Like what's special about this movie is like you see her acting at a register that she's never done elsewhere in her career, which is like this like very highly affected like very um uh like highly artificial mode that is also like this kind of open open wound type character too or characters and tom hanks kind of does a similar thing where he's like this very stilted very affected mannerisms but at the same time is like very openly like vulnerable as well and like that's kind of the movie as a whole is it's very like it has this affected mode that at the same time is like just incredibly sincere about like where it ends up going. Um, and I think that it's like super special. Like I was not expecting it to be like that at all. And I dug it significantly. Uh, and I, as you mentioned uh, at the top of uh, particularly from uh, John pa- Patrick Shanley, right? <laughs> person who's known. Yeah, for exactly. Now, right? Like uh-huh. this is like, I hadn't looked him up beforehand. So I didn't like, I couldn't place him. But if you had told me the guy from doubt made this movie, this would not have been ever the movie I would have guessed. And like I was reading a review and I can't remember whose review it was. It was a critic's review saying that how much of a shame it was that John Patrick Shanley never really directed again. Like he, he has some screenplays like, um, for instance, we're back the dinosaur story, like the animated oh, dinosaur movie, what? which is another, what? Yeah. He wrote the screenplay for that movie. I think. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking um, at it. Okay. <laughs> but it was like, that's another one that was like the guy uh-huh, from doubt did this, uh-huh. but like, he never sincerely directed a movie again. Like he made the adaptation of doubt, uh, but that's a pretty straight adaptation. There's not a lot of like, you know, he doesn't stray too far from like what the stage is. Um, and like, it, there's, there's a real shame in like, he doesn't have more of a filmography because this movie shows this like tremendous spark uh, and like this tremendous personality that I think like, you know, could have really you know, resulted in some other really great movies had he, I don't know. I mean, I know this movie kind of had a middling reception when it first came out just because it's so offbeat. Um, and part of me is kind of like interested in a what if alternate universe in which like this had been a smash and, you know, what would, what would John Patrick Shanley's career have looked like? I mean, what would Meg Ryan's career have looked like or Tom Hanks's career? Like had this kind of bizarre movie of theirs taken off more so than like, I don't know, like Forrest Gump or Sleepless in Seattle or something. What what a world. Uh, I, I guess, though, too, it looks like he also wrote the screenplay for Moonstruck, oh, that share right. Nicolas Cage movie from, totally the, from the 80s. That. Oh, no way. So <laughs> that was that came out like three years yeah, before this. So I don't know. Maybe, maybe you're like, oh, that guy. Oh, he's going to do this movie? Oh, he's okay. also like... going to do Doubt. He's also... Uh, I mean, we've only mentioned mm-hmm. Doubt, but he's a quite accomplished... Uh, Mm-hmm. playwright like he i think that's like more so where his career has been um but it does um, look like he has something teed up for this year it whatever this wild mountain time is uh based off a of play it looks like it was set to direct it was announced in uh, may 2019 so i don't know yeah go go figure it has emily blunt and john ham and christopher walken in it so okay. who knows what that'll be like well from me and Terry to everyone, please go watch Joe versus the Volcano. There you go. All right. Well, let's take a quick break. We'll be back talking about some uh, surreal silent features after this. Cinematary listeners, this is your favorite Filipino podcaster, Jessica Carr. I'm here to let you know about a couple of things that Cinematary offers that you might not know about. First, if you're a fan of what Cinematary is doing, please consider joining us on Patreon. Remember when we weren't clamoring for your dollars? Or now we're just clamoring for five of your dollars. So please help us and donate to our Patreon, and then you'll get exclusive content from our staff, including our film theory and 
Chill series, where a panel takes a piece of theory each month and deconstructs it before diving into whatever topic is on their mind from the past week. The $5 each month is investment in the website and the podcast, and it goes solely to paying our writers for the reviews each week, so please consider doing it. It's only $5. If you missed an episode of Cinematary or a piece of writing we've had, you should consider signing up for our free newsletter. Each Sunday, we send out a note with the latest podcast episode, piece of Patreon content, and the last two reviews that we've written at Cinematary.com. It's perfect for those of you who are interested in what's happening, and it makes sure that you don't miss a single Cinematary review. Finally, the easiest thing that you can do to help us is to please, please give us a rating and review on iTunes, Spotify, or whatever else you're using to listen to the show. This helps us get more eyeballs and ears on the podcast and the website, and it helps the people know about Cinematary, which is really what we're here for. So to recap, consider donating to our Patreon, sign up for the free newsletter, and give us a rating or review. We would really appreciate if you could do these things. Thank you for listening, and now back to the show. back with part two of episode 288 of cinematary uh, in this part we're continuing our intro to avant-garde series with a selection of surreal silence which i will preface by by saying this doesn't mean every one of these silences like a surreal it's not they are not all surreal as we've established off mic for an extended amount of time <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> it yeah i i know Andrew's listening. I'm sorry. It, it's n- nothing disparaging. It's more just confusion. Um, but anyway, uh, just a little preface. We, of course, in the show notes, we also have uh, these titles listed on our uh, series page. And if you go to the Cinematary YouTube channel, I have a I created a playlist because all of these are on YouTube. So you could make a nice. You can use that. And make a nice little uh, little little afternoon of uh, of watching these to to you know keep up with us but let me go ahead and kick us off the first one on this list is uh from 2016 uh by director bill morrison who i believe um we've covered his films uh, a number of times in the past um this one is called the dock worker's dream and uh it it has these um i guess kind of 1910s 1920 1930 era um era uh black and white kind of documentary footage of these workers go- working in a shipyard going to uh going to their jobs kind of walking past just um you know working on a on a dock um for the mo- for pretty much a lot of the first part it kind of it melds into like this to this kind of cityscape scene uh people just living in in kind of a uh post-industrial revolution you know very close after that um city and then um it breaks in kind of in the second half into this uh these these people in cars kind of driving around the savannas it looks like the savannas of of africa um chasing wild uh antelope and uh and zebras and such and it's all scored um by the by the hustle from lamb chop and uh this was one probably out of all the movies that we watched for this section was probably my favorite. I love this a lot. Um, there's something like kind of melting about this song where you just kind of melt into this um, this space and you have kind of this reverberating rhythm and uh, you're watching just like these sequences of like life passing you by. There's something a little bit, it's, it's, you kind of have this like high feeling, even though you haven't like 
um, smoked anything. It's like you just kind of are at this elevated state. <laughs> at least I was. I really enjoyed this. Um, I mean, I like the other ones, but I was like really on a on a on a on a kick from the first uh, mm-hmm. from the you know from the start off. But uh, I'm curious, what do you what do you all make of Doc Worker's Dream? I think I basically like this because I really like that Lamb Chop song. I don't think I would have any interest in this movie <laughs> yeah, whatsoever if the music wasn't there. Which I mean, I guess like that's the package we're given intentionally, but. I think that I actually have no interest in the visuals. <laughs> oh no. Wow. <laughs> Coming down hard. I mean, it's good. I enjoyed the, like, you know, the, it, they're good visuals to match the song. But when I was mm-hmm. watching this, I was thinking, this is a great song. I was not thinking too hard about like the visuals I was seeing. Well, I think it was a yeah, good compliment to, uh, sorry, uh, to the things that were actually occurring. I mean, there's like such a, a pulsing rhythm to the base of the song right i mean and the movie is ultimately about like the a lot of people's labor but uh, if it's given the title of the the short here that it's a person in particular that we end up following in kind of an abstract way of uh a dock worker but also uh textile factories and uh (laughs) there's one point to where after like a whole like roll of textile gets produced they just like roll it out on a street for for some reason. I guess just you know, the, a lot of this movie feels like, hey, oh, we got a camera, let's document everything, and it was that was pretty neat. Um, but it like ends up becoming a process of pe- these people's work, and in this case, also textile work. And uh, at what point there's a, a guy in the background in that kind of rolling out of the textile where he looked like he has nothing to do with what's going on, but he wanted to get involved. He's like. Oh, the thing's about to hit this thing, uh, this, uh, you know, street pole. And he just kind of goes over there with his umbrella and like helps straighten it up. It, it's just real weird and specific. I was like, what? <laughs> what is happening? Um, but, uh, it, just uh, by way of comparison, some of this kind of like got me to a similar pace in an abstract way of thinking about, um, uh, Jody Mack, who we'll end up talking about later and about how textile gets around. I mean, I guess more specifically, her grand bazaar you know, feature recently. Right. But, uh, I don't know. I, I did, I did like this one, including its visuals just because of how much of a process it all was. If it wasn't, you know, <laughs> especially interesting in the, in that way that like the other ones that we're talking about are, I really did like the, uh, I mean, I, I realized I came out saying, I really just like the song, it's but I did really like good. the shots of, good um, the, the textile, I mean, the textile, Mm-hmm. like machines at work i really did like watching that that was pretty mm-hmm. mesmerizing um to i guess to explain why because this program is like mostly you know early silent film and this is obviously like from 2016 um and actually premiered at big years in 2016 that was the world premiere um a little upcoming you know uh, ad for that <laughs> festival um but uh, when Andrew and I were like talking about this series and what we wanted to do, you know, for this first part of like kind of historical foundational early experimental films, you know, we wanted to include something by the filmmaker Bill Morrison because pretty much all of his movies are repurposing old, often decaying archival footage from the earliest days of cinema. And so even though this is a recent thing, I mean, obviously it like has a silent film logic because it's working with the music and it's just like totally uh, about that kind of the rhythm of the visual editing in tandem with the, the musical soundtrack. And I think it shows how experimental film is like really a lot of times about history you know and like is how uh avant-garde film can kind of function as this like archive because artists are going back and going through old footage old films and media and materials and repurposing them giving them a new meaning or even in the case of this movie like we probably wouldn't be watching this footage if it was not presented in the context of this film you know otherwise it would just be like scattered images of people in you know the olden days (laughs) um just like and we would just you know it would just be like pictures from a history textbook but just like presenting it in this way makes it i think like live again to use a sort of cliche um but i don't know i think it like is an interesting place to start to talk about like 
um, early abstract and avant-garde filmmaking. Um, let's move on to the the second f- film, and that kind of goes back more. Uh, I think th- it's 1921. Yeah, 1921. Yeah, 1921. Um, But Nathan, why don't you introduce this one? So this is uh, Manhattan, a short nonfiction film um, by two actually like non filmmakers, the painter Charles Steeler, um, who's also a commercial photographer and the photographer Paul Strand. And this is kind of different from the other films. You know, we mentioned at the beginning that... The title of this episode is Surreal Silence, and that a lot of these films that we're looking at are like very intra, uh, influenced by the tradition of surrealism and, you know, by dream logic and this sort of like cut up style of Salvador Dali, you know, just like kind of putting these different objects together and these different provocative images together in a sort of way that maybe has a like mental emotional logic, but you can't really summarize in a clear way. Um, so this is different obviously because it's a pretty straightforward documentary just about like the city of manhattan just uh it's just 65 different shots just kind of like going through the city from the ferry you know through skyscrapers um and it has these quotes from walt whitman um in intertitles and it's got a musical soundtrack added on later um you know and it's a little straightforward like i found this to be one of the uh maybe lesser compelling films in this episode but i do think it is just an interesting historical connection at least from something that we've talked about we talked about a long time ago but um ziga vertov's man with a movie camera um when we did a documentary series years ago and just like the tradition of city kind of symphony films um just like you know documentaries that aren't you know narrative like conventionally narrative sort of told to us but just like images of the city life in the city and those films are often like very driven by editing and in the montage and like very focused in a kind of musical rhythm and so i feel like that sort of even if it may not look experimental in the way that the other movies in this episode do it does I think maybe like set a precedent for like a certain kind of style or like certain kind of editing maybe that becomes popular in avant-garde film well it it reminds me of it reminds me of something that uh, Andrew talked about last week where he was talking about um, we we were hitting on stuff like uh, Be Gone Dull Care and Synchro Me Number 2 where it's these um, kind of mar- or even to cut and feud the the fantasia part where it's like this marriage of like music and uh, these kind of abstract figment images and it's it's like you're processing it less through like a visual sense and more through like how you process music and how you uh you know make sense of music and with this one it's almost like kind of like an easy transition because it to me it was almost it was like the opening scene of manhattan but with no romance at all uh it was just like very straightforward and uh but you still kind of have that marriage of like the music and how it propels like the images and speaks through the images and the so it's like you're you're processing it both visually and uh you know how you would process those more abstract musical uh pieces and it's like it's like this weird collage that you're all that, that's all mashed together and so um i don't i didn't totally love this one but there was something kind of compelling about it i think yeah i mean that abstraction is kind of interesting also like to bring up another thread that was talked about last week where um, I guess it was Jessica and Miranda talking about how, um, you know, for them, like they find connection with people in, in movies and a lot of ab- uh, avant-garde cinema is less about people and more about textures or, you know, different things like that. And I think that this is a movie like it, it's not like devoid of human, you know, humanity, but it is definitely a movie that is not interested in any one person. Um, and in that way, it kind of makes it itself abstract from like, you know, our traditional narrative cinema because it doesn't um, present human beings in a narrative sense. It presents human beings as part of a collage, um, which I think is kind of interesting. I mean, to your point, uh, Michael, the this movie kind of runs on the sense of scale of these buildings, right? To where like our intro is a fairy coming in and kind of seeing, you know, uh, how big it is or how much of like a, a frame it is. And then when we actually enter 
the city itself, then we get kind of bombarded and overwhelmed by the scales of these buildings. Um, and uh, more than once we get this, the shot of, uh, I mean, they're either like really extremely low angle shots or really high angle shots. But in this case, there's a high angle shot where it's, um, a cathedral and it's like a cemetery. And you get this kind of split between that on the left and then just the busyness of the city on the right of all the people and the cars going by. Um, and I mean, to, to that end, this felt like a really, uh, with the, with the score, uh, I don't know if this one originally had the score that we listened to in it. I think Nathan, you mentioned that, um, that yeah, score got added later. I don't know which version. I just watched the one that, uh, we linked to. Um, but it was like a lot dire, you know, even with like the Whitman quotes that was kind of, you know, uh, making the grand portent of how large and amazing these buildings are. But like everything felt, yeah, uh, to scale, just <laughs> kind of stressful and ominous. Uh, and which felt like a, a decided difference to uh, the dock worker's dream as like another documentary city people film where it's just uh, that one felt uh, particularly by the end, if not melancholic, but uh, like more particularly uh, emotional. That <laughs> This one's just more dread, almost dreadful, uh, even if we're supposed to be in awe of the city itself. Let's move on to our, our third one. And Michael, you're up. Yeah, sure. So this is um, called The Life and Death of 9413, a Hollywood Extra, um, which is from, is it 1928? Yeah. Um, so this is a movie from 1928, and it's basically um, this, uh, I mean, this is a surreal film for the most part, um, It's a, but it's also a satire of um, the Hollywood industry um, because what we see is, like, in this very, um, like, impressionistic and, like, um, uh disjointed manner um the this narrative of this guy who goes to um goes to hollywood and he you know has these uh he has this actor he looks up to um who's also an extra apparently um so this guy comes to be a successful person in uh hollywood and then he's just crushed by the system basically and he can't find success um but it's all done through this extremely um uh evocative style so uh, wherein like nothing's really presented literally. Um, you have like, for instance, when the actors are acting quote unquote, they're just putting masks or, or pieces of paper in front of their faces. Um, you get like these, you know, uh, kind of quick edits and, uh, double exposures and, and things like that, that really make this, uh, film work more on like dream logic than, uh, regular logic. Um, there is a lot of, um, instead of actually having like city streets and, and buildings, there are these really small and very obviously like constructed, um, out of like paper and, and string, um, like silhouettes and like, you know, cardboard cutouts and things that, that, uh, are supposed to, um, represent like the, the hustle and bustle of Los Angeles, I guess. Um, and, uh, I mean, I really liked it. I mean, it feel. I mean, I mentioned Brazil, uh, with Joe versus the volcano in part one, and it it does feel in a certain way of a like a setting a precedent for that kind of satire. Like it's, um, it's it's more heavily avant garde than like those sorts of movies that are like um kind of set satires of like industry or or something like that. But as the same sort of bent in which like people's humanity is is warped through this like fantastical setting that is like very artificially rendered in the movie um and like the people kind of cease like lose their humanity in a way through these like you know contorted environments um and it, it's kind of funny though too like there's there's mm -hmm. like shots of like the characters <laughs> talking and they look like if you've ever oh seen like um like sprites in a jrpg talking to one another where like the mouth just like oh open and close like clearly uh -huh. like not actually making sounds <laughs> um and or if it, if they are, it'd probably be borderline like uh, either in Finding Nemo when the birds <laughs> yeah, are yeah. saying mine, or or like SpongeBob. I think there's also those like schools of fish that would oh, be yeah. like really <laughs> gapy, right? Oh my god! I kept uh, sorry, I I couldn't help but like think what this would have been like if it was a SpongeBob episode. Like I thought, like Patrick was the star, <laughs> and he like really was like overwhelming Squidward, who was actually trying to be an actor. But only became an extra. It does Sorry. kind anyway. of have like that SpongeBob energy <laughs> of it being like kind of manic silliness, but played with a sort uh -huh. of like 
high-minded dignity um, in a way that's like, <laughs> I, I thought it was, pr- it's it's like both fun and then, I mean, it, obviously subtextually depressing, but um, I mean, it's really, it's like as an experience, it's a pretty fun and lively experience. Um, uh, definitely more so than like something like Manhattan, which is abstract to to a pretty large degree, whereas this is, is narrative and there's recognizable characters that you follow. Um, it's just through this, this lens that's like highly unconventional. Yeah. I feel like everybody in the movie is like basically a machine, you know, they're not humans. And so it sort of feels a little bit like a cartoon with people in it. Um, but it also, uh, what was I, God, what was I just going to say? Um, Oh, it, it really, to me, it feels like it's like the closest that American cinema ever got to like German expressionism where the people are just like totally part of the scenery and can be manipulated in the same way that like a, you know, a set can. Um, and it was also uh, a little fun fact. Um, this, so the, one of the co-directors of this Slavko Vorkovich, um, he was sort of like noted for making what he called tone poems, which a lot of them were these sort of just like abstract nature focused films. And they were really uh, influential on a young George Lucas, uh-huh. um, <laughs> whose movies, <laughs> Uh, THX 1138, the title of that is sort of inspired by the title of this movie. So, little Hollywood fun fact. This was also, this movie had a lot of industry support too, right? Like, uh, um, I'm pretty sure, like, I, I don't know, this is just from scanning. The Wikipedia page about this movie is insane. Like, it's super <laughs> in depth, weirdly in depth. Yeah. Um, but also, like, I mean, there were, like, some pretty um, important people involved with this. Like, I guess Charlie Chaplin was a major proponent of this movie, which makes sense. Like, it feels like a right. predecessor to modern times. It got a push. In a lot of ways. Um, and then, like, uh, it was uh, partially shot by Greg Toland, who went on to work on, like, a, like a Citizen Kane and stuff. Um, so, I mean, like a lot of avant-garde, I feel like is outside of the, like any sort of establishment, like is these kind of like, um, uh, like iconoclastic, these iconoclastic works. Whereas this one is interesting, I think on like a meta level, just because of like how much it is, um, involved in like the Hollywood system as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, which is interesting to your point, because I think, um, I mean, work and pitch went on to like be basically a montage editor in a real way in other films. But, uh, Robert Flory, uh, he goes on to like do two other shorts kind of like on his own time, but he basically gets taken in by the Hollywood system as a director. Uh, I think maybe one of his main ones was, uh, was it, um, Oh, I'm going to forget what's it called. Uh, is a Poe story. It's like murders and yeah, there it is. Murders in the Rue morgue. Uh, and he kind of like became a horror director in a way. That was like his main thing, which I guess, you know, it, after you watch this, you wouldn't be too surprised <laughs> considering, yeah, some of the German expression, you know, uh, stuff that's going on in here uh, that uh, he'd go on to, to do some of that. But, you know, I, I was amazed, like, yeah, at a certain point, he also just became a TV director in the 50s. So this guy had a had a pretty long career uh, for this kind of to be the kind of starting point uh, for that. So. Um, Nathan, uh, the next one. <laughs> yeah, our next film is from 1936, jumping ahead just a little bit, um, by the artist Joseph Cornell. It's called Rose Hobart. Um, Joseph Cornell is a really, really interesting guy. In addition to being an experimental filmmaker, he was also a visual artist. Um, he made a lot of collages and shadow boxes and just like different sculptures out of kind of bric a brac. Um, he was also a notorious recluse. Um, Um, He lived in Flushing, Queens pretty much his whole life and like very rarely ever strayed from there and um, didn't really leave New York ever and just took care of his sick mother and his brother his whole life. Um, So this movie was um, I think it's really interesting because it shows the sort of like 
how collage as a sort of like artistic practice, I think is very important to avant-garde film. Um, and so this movie is assembled out of scraps from a 16 millimeter print of the movie East of Borneo from 1931, which, um, Cornell bought at a junk shop. And according to Wikipedia, um, to make the 77 minute film less tedious for repeated viewings, uh, he would cut parts down, rearrange parts or like add in pieces of nature films um, until finally it was just 19 minutes long and mostly just shots of the lead actress whose name supplies the name of this film. Um, And so there's a weird way that this kind of like is a, a progenitor to like fan film or like super cuts, you know, you go on YouTube and people will just have like clips of their favorite actors assembled together. And this is essentially kind of a very early version of that. Um, And Cornell took all the audio from the film and would play record uh, over this like Brazilian record that he also found in a junk shop over it, um, just looping these songs. Um, And so the first time the movie was shown in 1936, um, it was being exhibited um, as part of a, just like a program of Cornell's other short films. Apparently Salvador Dali was in the audience and he was so upset by the film that he knocked the projector over, interrupted the screening. And the reason why is because he said, uh, my idea for a film is exactly that. I was going to propose it to someone who would pay to have it made. I never wrote it down or told anyone. It's as if he had stolen it from my subconscious or my dreams. So the movie Cornell, of course, being this recluse was so shook by this, you know, and, and this was like a movie kind of influenced by, I think the surrealist tradition and by, and it has a sort of dolly like dream logic to it. You know, it's very hazy, weird, no clear narrative, just these images. Um, he was, Cornell was so shaken by this that he didn't uh, agree to exhibit the film again until the 1960s. Um, when he had a sort of revival as uh, the American avant-garde really grew during that time. And it was also, the film was projected through a piece of blue glass. Um, sorry for all the context. I just think it's like a fascinating backstory. Um, but I don't know. I think this is like a really, like I said, really shows like how just collage as like an art form and as a maybe way of like just thinking about the relationship between images is very sometimes like key to avant-garde film. Because when you look at a collage, like, you know, there's maybe not a, a narrative, but there's like definitely a feeling by that comes from just placing all of these disparate images in the same space and putting them all together. Um, and I think this movie is, is really like a very good early example of that kind of tendency in experimental film. What did you guys think of it? It took me a while to like not make a narrative out of it. Like, because uh, for like a strong minute, yeah. it, it, it is a early Hollywood movie. And so I like, I just started to start to follow as a narrative. And then it kept cutting back to her expressions that I don't know what the context were. The reaction shots are for. <laughs> I still kept trying to piece it together. And when things really started to reoccur, where she had kept uh, meeting this uh, prince uh, king like character or sultan, uh, and then this kind of uh, uh, threatening volcano in a back, uh, but also uh, she seemed to be like several characters in the movie, and so because I was trying to follow like a narrative, it got it got real weird, real quick, and I was also confused now that we talked about Joe versus the volcano that I was somehow a, a sacrifice movie to the volcano was it and so it was you know uh problematic 30s you know uh, native indigenous rituals here to where there's going to be a ritual sacrifice so that's fun <laughs> um i didn't really <laughs> i don't know how, I, I didn't really have a reaction to this one i wasn't sure like what to do with it really you know it, it after a while i kind of I don't know. I, I just wasn't, I guess I wasn't kind of on the level that it was, it was trying to do and it never really, <laughs> I was just, I, I kind of was just a little disconnected the entire time. I was also, I was pretty bored during this. I gotta be honest. Um, and I think, so there's like a strain in avant-garde that 
um, the premise or the, the, the making of the movie is the interesting part of the movie. And then the movie itself is kind of disposable. And I felt like that this was absolutely the case for, for me at least where I love the idea of someone like getting this old movie, well, I guess it wasn't old at the time, getting this movie, um, and thinking, boy, this movie could sure be improved if I only showed the lead actress's parts. Um, and I like kind of love that idea but then you watch it and like <laughs> there's no narrative and like there's like that interesting blue tint but like, that's oh. only interesting for a little bit for me because it's like the only aesthetic thing that's going on in the movie other than like the fact that it's just cobbled together from another existing narrative and so it didn't really work for me but I love the the idea behind it which I think is true of lots of avant-garde for me. Yeah. I mean I think that's like a good point because it just sort of shows like the connection of avant-garde to like other forms of visual art versus like narrative film where generally our expectation with a narrative film is just like the sort of experience that the whole thing supplies but a lot of times like you say you know it's totally true like with avant-garde film and a lot of like painting or whatever a lot of times it's the practice like itself that is you know the the most interesting or most innovative thing about it and the end result is almost kind of like <laughs> incidental a little bit i think uh maybe um, if to not call this not successful what it's doing I, a version of this that i thought was interesting recently that we talked about god was it two years ago now the green fog guy Manton's thing that oh, was like gosh, yeah. Oh, yeah. that was like yeah stapling together a whole bunch of like reaction shots of movies that were shot in san francisco and like building this weird portrait <laughs> of all of those things particularly but that's the opposite sure, right? right where they take these reaction shots from and other making movies it, to yeah. create a pre-existing mm -hmm. movie. as opposed to i guess necessarily um, a supercut but it i mean i don't know those are like working with the same kinds of material but to different ends i guess because this one I guess it's just a, like a fan video. It's like, hey, check out Rose Hobart. She's cool. And <laughs> but, you know, uh, yes, with the the green fog, uh, like a whole bunch of different movies, not just the one movie specifically gets brought together to create kind of an internal meaning of, a, I guess, the green fog of San Francisco. Well, it's whatever. vertigo, right? Isn't it? Right. You yeah, that's the vertigo that's, out of the. Yeah, that's like the, uh, I don't know, key, key film or something. Right. Uh, I guess to read it. Um but you should read more about Rose Hobart. I was just kind of scanning it over here and like she becomes like a real workers, uh, actors, workers rights thing of like trying to get like eight hour days. And I, I think this one also, uh, this movie specifically, uh, yeah, at Wikipedia here it says when I did East of Borneo, that schlocky horror film I did, we shot all night. They started at six o'clock at night and finished at five in the morning. For two solid weeks, I was working with alligators, jaguars, and pythons out of the back lot. I thought, is this acting? It was ridiculous. We were militant about the working conditions. We wanted an eight-hour day like everybody else. Uh, wow. It's, Hell it's, yeah. Comrade Rose. And so she goes on to, yeah, get investigated by HUAC, and uh, that didn't turn out well. So I guess that ended oh, her shit. career. So yeah, go... Go figure. Damn, we need the Rose Hobart biopic. <laughs> oh, it's true. Honestly. Damn. I would watch that. Anyways. <laughs> um, all right, so shifting to our, our next uh, short here, we have Unshin Andalou, the, uh, the Louis Boonwell, um, Salvador Dali film that I don't know why I told, told myself I would you know do this one. <laughs> Uh, I like this one a lot. It was it was a it was a wild one. Um, yeah, well, because it opened. So this one is pretty famous because people have probably seen the the uh, the sequence where the they slice the eye with the razor, um, and that's what that's what kicks off this movie. But you, you know, what they always forget is they have that uh, killer match cut between um, like the moon uh with the cloud going over it and then it, it match cuts with like the razor it's super it's fantastic um but also that's kind of the evocative image that people think of with this but um after that it has this title card that says eight years later and then it follows this guy who's like riding his bike and then a woman is reading a book looking outside and then she goes back to her book and then she looks outside again and he's fallen over on the curb um and so she goes and she grabs him and helps him uh helps him up and then uh <laughs> she has like the she like assembles his clothes like as if it was a person <laughs> on the bed um 
and then he appears and they like kind of uh stare at his hand and it transitions and it has like um ants coming out of his hand and then it yeah it's it's a hole and then it um and then you have this whole sequence with like the armpit hair with the armpit hair becomes a mustache and um <laughs> and then uh if you can't forget that um and then you have like this kind of um young woman who's like in the street and she's just kind of like moseying around the street and then uh <laughs> then she like pokes this it's like a severed head that's just in the in the middle of the street and there's like a crowd around it and she's like poking the head and then um it, she you she ends up and she's like uh like in the middle of the street with the, clutching a box and then she just gets hit by a car <laughs> and the <laughs> and the couple before like sees that through the window and then like he gets turned on by that and then like starts grabbing her boobs and then like it has like this these weird cuts where it's like her with a, a t- with, like with clothes on and her without clothes on and then with clothes on and it's just like this like weird cut back and forth um and then she like rejects him and when she rejects him and he's like chasing her around um <laughs> for whatever reason he gets caught in, in this like priest, yeah, kind of like, like sled apparatus thing and there's like dead donkeys and there's pianos and there's priests and there's like stone tablets and pumpkins and might be the uh, ten commandments for all i know that's good <laughs> so he like has to like like crawl through all of that to like get to her um but then she traps him <laughs> in his little, you know ant hand uh <laughs> and so then um the young man like has this whole sequence where he's like uh trying to like get to her and she tries to answer the door but then um <laughs> there's like another there's like another person who like yells at him and then they like have like this whole confrontation and then it cuts to 16 years later or 16 years ago sorry and you have like this guy and he's like looking at books and stuff and then he's staring at a wall in front of another person and then the books become guns and so he shoots the other person uh and then he carries the corpse away and then it returns to the woman who like goes to this apartment and then sees a giant moth and then uh like kind of like fixes herself up and like gets angry at the the first young guy and then it cuts and like pretty much you see like this like sand and it's like it looks like the, the, you can see the couple that's like buried at the beach and you'll know if it's like they're dead or they're just like doing that whole half body thing i don't know it's a wild ride it's kind of like the epitome of like surrealism uh, avant-garde like this is when people go avant-garde cinema what's that and then they th- this is kind of one of those i think go-to examples <laughs> um but it's pretty wonderful and i like that it has like this strange like it's like a precursor to Mike Myers' The Cat in the Hat movie. It's great. I love this movie. I would put those on the same level. I love both of them. So I think explaining that's my, it that's my thing. also calls attention to how successful... Like, it, it sounded like you were telling me about a dream you had. Um, and that's, like, exactly a, like part of what this movie is going for is this, like... And, I mean, that's a big thing with surrealism in general is, like, the evocation of, like, the subconscious mind. Um and I think this movie does a great job of that. Um, it also, I guess, and like as context was meant as like a, like an intentional middle finger to like the bourgeois like tastes of like cinema goers. But I guess a lot of cinema goers ended up liking it anyway, which, which uh, Dali and uh, Bunuel like hated. But also, they shouldn't have made this movie so damn delightful if they wanted like people Oops. to hate it. <laughs> Is Bung Wall going to have that problem throughout his career? Because that's kind of his deal uh, by the end of it, right? Is like thumbing his nose to Bourgeois, but like they end up watching it and kind of liking it. So I mean, I think oh, yeah. some of his other movies are more explicitly oh, political, like The Exterminating but, Angel or like yeah. um, Lodge Thor. Um, those are both like explicitly like political as far as like what they're going about. Whereas I don't feel like 
maybe I missed some subtext, but this movie just seems like it's <laughs> just like wacky. Like, you know, it's not it's it's political in the sense of he was trying to upset like certain norms but i don't know if the text of the movie itself is outside of that context super political maybe yeah. i missed well it. I, I mean i don't know i mean i made fun about you know uh the ten commandments potentially being on that dude's back but i think there's if you want to read it that's like catholic guilt it's keeping that dude uh full of full of shame yeah so but uh yeah i don't know this uh it's yeah it's hard to wrangle some of this because it is so I mean, to like your your point, Michael and Zach having to describe it, it's like kind of quote unquote comedic gags, you know, like the way he edits things together is intentionally nonsensical, but it gets you into a, a headspace that you guys yeah were describing kind of like in a dreamlike way. So having to like recall that or even like experience that it's like, yeah. Uh, and uh, I, th- I think that point uh, when the one woman character like runs away from that dude she goes through that door and when she goes to that door she ends up on the beach and i think this that kind of cut will be important to the movie we talk about uh and comparing and contrasting next um but so nathan sound like yeah i mean it's sh- i think the like link between surrealism and avant-garde film can't be understated because film this film especially really is like one of the first to recognize i think explicitly like cinema's unique capacity to recreate dreams and like recreate the experience of a dream and the the visual logic where objects become other objects and things are like not quite what they seem and don't make a clear linear sense but they're connected in some kind of like hidden way um where things have importance and meaning that you're maybe not sure of but you know that it's important um so i don't know i think the like influence of this movie can't really be overstated because it just really did show i think how by linking images of objects or people or whatever that you can uh create a meaning beyond just a clear narrative which i think is really the point of avant-garde film of creating a feeling and a a meaning beyond just you know communicating a plot um well, for the sake of time, let's let's move to uh, our next one, and uh, we're really honored here at Cemetery to have the foremost scholar uh, in Maya Darren. Stop. Um, no, I'm sure. <laughs> I don't need to tell you guys. I'm sure you already know this, but uh, Dylan, if Zach, you could, why? if you could dive into your craft for us for a second. No, our, why? Your, our, we why we should say we should that? preface that your review of uh, Maya Darren's At Land on the Cinematary website is like one of our uh, best performing articles ever. One of the highest viewed. Just consistently, all the time, people are clicking on that thing. There's at least twenty to thirty people each month who read it. It's, it's crazy. That's comforting and nice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, I guess just to explicitly link it to the movie we just talked about, um, you know, this came, uh, how many, uh, this is like 1943 is when Meshes of the Afternoon uh, came out. And before trying to describe it, I, I, I think to uh, just get to that point quickly, that it's it's funny we talk about surrealism and dream logic because there's certainly a lot of dream logic happening in this movie but from everything that i keep seeing and reading that like maya darren very specifically did not care for uh surrealism and was actually annoyed by the comparisons because it was supposed to be contained and the work as a whole has a feeling and a meaning onto itself and the difference between this meshes and Unshan Andaluf, just as an example, is that, you know, we were joking about the the cuts and the edits and the nonsensical objects put together. Uh, those almost become like gags and like shock value and just like really uh, just for uh, uh, sometimes for absurdity's sake, which which is fine and fun on its own. But this movie meshes it like very purposefully has just like a handful of objects that get used and transformed into each other over and over again. So uh, just by way of to try to summarize what happens in this movie is that <laughs> a mannequin hand drops a flower 
from above onto a street. And uh, the character, the woman, as a shadow, picks it up and walks into it. And mostly what happens in this movie is like a recursion into her following the shadow figure uh, that leads her to going into this house. And this house seems like something maybe bad just happened into it. Everything's like a little disheveled and put out of place. And she ends up having to go upstairs uh, following, you know, a feeling or a worry. And uh, this uh, record's playing. It's looping. She takes it off. She lays down. It looks like she takes a nap, which just brings us into another place in the movie to where she sees herself back on the street following the shadow figure, which is becomes more embodied here as this mirror faced nightmare <laughs> of a character that she follows. And that leads her back into the house. But then her husband or this person we can infer is her husband or a significant other is there. And, you know, I don't want to entirely describe the majority of this movie because I feel like it, experiencing it is it's, uh, its own sensation of following kind of in this recursive uh, pattern. But um, it is particularly uh, neat to try to talk through this as like a part of uh, avant-garde and surrealism in part because of my Darren is like held up as uh, the forefront of, I guess the, the second avant-garde wave in America to where she was embodied as like, a, you know, such an independent and, uh, promotional figure like she was so front forward of trying to have people on their own with their own resources to create films if they want and can and a lot of the time even if she wasn't you know uh, making these works like meshes and atland later that she was out you know uh, giving lectures and talking about film theory and and doing all this uh really interesting work outside of uh of filmmaking in and of itself to get everybody forward. And I think it happened around the time that the Museum of Modern Art really put resources into um, film and film circulation, particularly stuff that doesn't get seen a lot in bigger, you know, multiplexes or I guess, you know, uh, long run running uh, theater chains. Um, um, and so I don't know, like, yeah, so I just want to toss it over to you guys before I try to ha uh, talk any more about context for this movie. What do you guys think of it? Uh, I think I'll say off the bat that it's funny this movie and I think Unshin Andalu also are maybe the two movies that I s saw the most in classes in college and film <laughs> classes like I've seen them both yeah. like five or six times at this point I think and so they're didn't um didn't you uh, uh co uh, program that that surreal fest that with had both of those in it? Uh, yes, I did. Yeah. yeah, my freshman yeah. year, very weird. I, there you this go. surrealist film <laughs> festival at UT. I got roped into co programming hey, it with uh, <laughs> some like much older than me grad student, um, Richard Hermes. Yeah, I he was my peer in oh, the wow. creative writing master's program. Wow. Very interesting. Paths crossing. We didn't even know it. Um, and Nathan, you push and simple. Yeah, that was good. That's that was a crazy very movie. ridiculous. Um, but I, so they're both like both Meshes and Andalou are movies where I feel like because I've seen them so many times, I kind of forget like how well they work just like as pieces of filmmaking and like um, just I don't know. It's just like I I. I think of like, oh yeah, like that's meshes of the afternoon, but rewatching it is like always a little bit shocking. Just kind of the, like, I don't know. There's the, like somehow that objects are like given this power and like, like I was saying with Unshi and Andalou, you know, like they don't have this maybe like clear meaning, but you just like feel this uh, intensity and like the knife and, you know, the like the key. Yeah, exactly. Like you're, it's just things just mean something beyond their purpose in, in real life. And um, yeah, and I think that you uh, the context for this movie is very important because I feel like this is really seen as like you were saying this moment where avant-garde cinema became something like institutionalized and really like you know something that was 
officially recognized and supported by museums and galleries and not just like something that these weird little independent various artists were doing at the same time across the country or across the world. Um, it became like a movement, you know, around that time. I, I think one of the things that's interesting for me about both in and, um, Shinandalu and uh, Meshes of the Afternoon is that they were both movies that I had seen referenced a ton of times before I actually got around to watching them. Um, so, for example, like I, the reason why I watched Unshin Andalu the first time I watched it was because uh, in uh, the Pixies album Doolittle, the lead track talks about the slicing eyeballs uh. part, and I was like, wow, I got to see that. <laughs> um, and so I watched it. Um, and the same. Same goes for Meshes of the Afternoon, which I think, like, uh, is there, like, a Janelle Monáe video, I think, that, like, uh, alludes to, like, has, like, the yeah, mirror yeah. face person in it. And so I was like, what is that? And, like, I think it's really interesting how thoroughly both of these movies have kind of, like, permeated, like, the kind of collective, like, uh, artistic language of not just cinema, but, like, kind of cinema-adjacent things. And, like, these are real landmarks that, like, in the way that a lot of, like, famous narrative movies have kind of, like, you know, a lot of people know them by via the references. Like, I definitely knew these movies by reputation and reference more than uh, having seen them. Um, but I, I'm kind of like you, Nathan, where I've been assigned these, like, multiple times. I've only taken, like, two film classes, so... <laughs> but, yeah. I think I even watched, like at least one or two of these in an English class even, or like in, in some art class or something, you know, not even a film class going to your point about like the broader influence of these two movies. Michael, why don't you take us uh, to our last one? Sure. So uh, this last one is called fireworks. It's from 1947 by the um, pretty famous for avant-garde uh, director, Kenneth Anger. Um, and so uh so this movie is, uh, it's it's a little bit like both Meshes and uh, Unshi and Andalu in that there's kind of like this procession of like events that you could technically recap, but it would it would be kind of absurd at times to, to go completely beat by beat. Um, so like just basically what happens is that um, this movie is about a bunch of sailors and one particular um, who is having a dream, I guess, because he's called the dreamer. Um, and so in this dream, he basically, like, um, like he, he encounters all of this, like, hetero, or sorry, not hetero, uh, homoerotic um, imagery. <laughs> yeah, definitely not hetero. Like, you know, you see, like, this, like, sailor without a shirt on, and he's just flexing his muscles. And um, there's, like, a, there's a guy who, like, pulls out his dick, but it's really just a Roman candle, like, you know, just shooting, like, sparks. And <laughs> so, like, uh, and then at the end of the movie, uh, he wakes up, and there's a guy in bed next to him, and the guy's head has, like, this cool, like, like that effect you'll see sometimes where they've, like, scratched the celluloid. Um, and so there's, like, a halo-ish effect that's made by a scratched celluloid around his, like, partner's um, head and uh, it, I mean it's it's really interesting. I, uh, unlike, um, well, I guess like a lot like the recent films we've talked about, like it's surreal in the sense of like uh, using like these kind of um, images that are like you know on their face nonsensical for like subtextual values. And in this one, I mean, it's all about like you know uh, homosexuality and specifically, there's a lot of violence in this as well and. I mean, my guess would be that there, you know, since given like 1947 and um, the kind of sailor milieu is like, it's about like, a, you know, the tension between like the, you know, maybe self-loathing, like homophobia, um, coupled with like a sort of like, you know, undeniability of like, you know, sexuality. Um, and uh, I mean, I thought it was, I thought it was really interesting. I'm not actually seeing any of the other um, films by this guy. Um, but I, from what I gather, this is a pretty like representative work as far as the themes and, and, and stuff goes. Um, what do you guys think? Well, I think it gets into like another important, uh, tendency of avant-garde cinema where, you know, like we were talking earlier with, um, 
the life and death of a Hollywood extra. Uh, you know, he, Michael, you were talking about that as a sort of a, a rare case of like an avant-garde film that sort of is also a little bit in the industry, but just. Uh, you know, avant-garde film being outside of the Hollywood superstructure, it has the ability to, um, or at least in a time where like this kind of thing mattered, but where, you know, transgressive, subversive, often sexual content, you know, had no place in the cinema of good taste, uh, produced and promoted by Hollywood where, you know, this sort of experimental filmmaking was really the only place where you could explore, the themes that were looked down upon by good society. So, I mean, it's really a place where I think that like, um, queer filmmakers were able to find an avenue in, in a way that they would not in another kind of film, uh, film scene. Um, so I think this is like, I don't a very interesting, like, like you were saying, extending the sort of language of meshes and Unchi and Andalou, but taking it in this kind of like other unspoken, unconscious sexual direction. Um, and I think it's also worth pointing out that like Kenneth Anger started making stuff when he was really young and he made this movie when he was 20 years old. And I think you sort of see that, um, in some of the juvenile humor, uh, that shows up in this movie. But I think this is kind of also like an important link between surrealism and a movement an artistic movement that is really important to a lot of the films that we'll be talking about in the next episode which is like pop art you know of the of the 50s and 60s and i think that like kenneth anger is kind of the link there where maybe not in this movie so much but in some of the other work you know he's work he's working with just these like very almost like archetypal sort of images of American life, you know? Um, I guess in this one, you know, just like the Navy, you know, like the 4th of July, just sort of these like visual tropes of America. Um, and then in his other movies, like, you know, kind of using like the biker and using pop music, um, just like taking, I think we've seen a lot of these films, just like taking things that have a very established agreed upon meaning and then just sort of like changing the context that those images are presented in to us. Um, I think this movie really sort of exemplifies that. Yeah, I think like taking the, you know, for instance, in that, that shot of the guy just like flexing his muscles, you know, the masculine strength to becoming like a like a homoerotic signifier. Like and that, I, I feel like that that's a lot of this movie. Um is you know the military and the um you know the the sculpting of like the the ma masculine body being like subverted from like the kind of you know mainstream like kind of chest something like hetero version of it into like the the homo homosexual version of it which i think is like really interesting uh, i mean and to both of you guys points i mean the one that i'm more familiar with scorpio rising like just keeps pushing that you like to another extent <laughs> also in like full sadomasochism uh, by way of the bikers but also roping in yeah hollywood icons like james dean and brando right to where it's it's like actively antagonizing those images which you know uh, being that this is like anger's like early version that like all of that gets ramped up a lot more because that one that one was in a 60s right that was like 63 so he like building upon his work that he did before that that's like a further exploration and, and in terms of his influence too that was wild of using pop music in movies right that that kind of scorpio rising yeah absolutely has, has that kind of uh banner to hang on to where it's just <laughs> at that point it was like all all uh well there's a direct influence from Scorpio rising to mean streets right. and Martin Scorsese yep. and like the jukebox sort of movie soundtrack, yeah, yeah. like would, you know, I would have of course developed at some point, but maybe not in the way that it kind of did in the way that people think about like using, you know, rock and pop music in, in movie soundtracks, like well, anger is like really kind of set the template for that. Um, well, we are. I don't have too much. I don't have it really anything to to add on on fireworks, and we're running out of time, so I'm gonna wrap it up. Um, that will wrap up this episode of Cinematary. You can find us at Facebook at facebook dot com slash cinematary at Twitter and Instagram at handle at cinematary and on Letterboxd at letterbox dot com slash cinematary, where we. Uh, 
post all the movies that we talked about in this episode. Next week, we'll continue our avant-garde series with Structure and Psychedelia. Um, so stick around for for, for that one. Um, but uh, yeah, of course, you can find uh, all these movies in our list. Uh, you can find it on Cinematary.com as well as in the show notes of this episode. Uh, head over to Cinematary.com. We got some reviews of Birds of Prey as well as a, a look back at Nancy Myers. It's complicated from 2009. So, uh, so definitely come over and check it out. Uh, thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.